Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of Voices of Rio. We're pleased that you're joining us this afternoon. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Donna Mitchell, and we are glad that you're here. We've got a special guest with us. Uh, it's our Chief of Police, Scott Borden, for the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College. Welcome. Glad you're with us this afternoon. No, thank you for having me. Uh, Chief Borden comes to Rio with over 38 years of experience in law enforcement, uh, five of which has been here at the university. And he's going to be talking just a little bit about uh, various aspects of safety on Rio's campus and then some things that are going on uh, broader, away from Rio, kind of nationwide. Uh, would you begin uh, talking to us just a little bit about Rio's uh, police force and the officers that we have on campus? Um, yes, sir. The um, Rio Grande University Police Department is a full-time, fully certified police agency. Uh, we have 24-7 coverage. There's always at least one officer on campus at all times. Uh, the officers are fully certified with full police powers and they're armed and they're armed for one reason and that's to keep the students and the faculty and visitors of this campus safe. Uh, we um, they're properly uniformed. We try to present, coming over from the State Highway Patrol, we try to present a professional looking officer. Uh, the hope in that is is that if a bad guy does come here or thieves come here that they're scared away and they see competent police officers. Um, if you remember the shooting at the Charleston Church in South Carolina mm -hmm. a couple months ago, a lot of people don't realize is there are witnesses that said that that guy went to um, Charleston College in Charleston a couple of days prior to that shooting with the intent of shooting college kids at the school, but because he saw uniformed, competent police officers, he left mm. looking for, now what he did was almost as horrific or right. if not worse, but that's why we have we have our guys try to look good in uniforms. They wear Stetsons. They won't have donut stuff all over their shirt. They won't have mud on their boots. But, but we are fully certified police officers. And they're also very willing to help in service beyond just that. I noticed that uh, they'll help. Pe they'll walk people to their cars at night if it's a, a kind of a darker area of the campus. Uh, they've been willing to help people get into a locked car if it's their car. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We, one of the things we brought over from the State Patrol, because the Dean of Students was, was a state trooper for 12 years, Aaron Quinn, my lieutenant was a state trooper for 35 years, and I was a state trooper for 33 years, and they're service oriented, and I think one of the things that the main thing we do here, other than to keep everybody safe, is to treat people with dignity and respect and be community service people so some of the things that we do is is if your car battery is is dead leave your lights on foggy day whatever um, we have a jump box we come and we jump your car for you if you lock your keys in your car they have a device that 99.9% of the time will get your car door unlocked so you don't have to you know spend $150 for locksmith yeah. to go do that um, any student faculty member anybody that has any issues going on ex-husbands ex-boyfriends girlfriends just somebody stalking you anything if you call campus police we will myself anybody will come over they'll walk you to your dorm they'll walk you to your car they'll walk you to your class um, put you in the police car or they'll put you in the golf cart and we we really hope that people take advantage of that because a lot of reasons that kids won't do it is because they're you know in the world we live in it's just you know nothing bad's going to happen to me and you yeah. know they'll think I'm stupid if I call and I bother them but that is not the case at all. We, our guys will come over there 100% of the time and they will never give you any grief. And if you ever have any issues, you should take care of it. I call. can tell you that they have done that for me a couple of times when I've either locked my key in my office or just needed to get in someplace that I didn't have a key. They've been very professional about doing that. I've well, also seen them do that for students many times in the parking lot. And I've seen them transport people who have mobility issues mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. buildings and from buildings. We do that. A lot of the athletes will have injuries. They injure their knees or their ankles or other students. And we will take them to class in the dorms and the golf cart. I just believe that we're a community. We're here to serve and protect. As corny as that as always sounds or used to be, I think that's what we're here for. And and the thing that I demand from my officers, I tell all the parents, I tell the students, I tell the faculty is 
is that they will be treated with dignity and respect, and it's something that I demand. They will, they will treat your faculty with dignity and respect. They will treat the students, the parents, and I always tell them they've got no other option other than to seek other employment. So I encourage the faculty and the students, if they're not treated with dignity and respect, or if they need service and they don't get it, to, to let me know and I'll take care of it. But luckily in five years, that's not happened, so I hope it'll continue. Chief Borden, we've heard a lot in the news lately about shootings, about shootings in schools and theaters, and it's frightening when we think about what could happen and, and how we need to be prepared. I know we, we have drills and we hear the active shooter drill. Could you talk to us a little bit about the issues of active shooter, and I believe you have a video that you can show us as well. Um, yes. I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, you, you look at the shooting in California, the Planned Parenthood shooting in, in in Colorado and then there was a school shooting in Oregon just a couple weeks before that. That's just in the last month. So it's the world we live in. Um, so active shooters is, is just a big serious problem right now and it's something that every university, every uh, every high school, every middle school deals with. So it's something we're very concerned about here. We actually had the state highway patrol SWAT team come in couple years ago and trained with our officers so um, th there's just some new strategies it used to be <clears throat> in the old days that the police if something bad happened like at a university here they would just surround the building with overwhelming force and keep the bad guy in and at that point school shootings were about nine to twelve minutes back when Virginia Tech started in 2007 that's a long that's nine a to long twelve long minutes time. to survive now with the new strategy that law enforcement have is it's, it's called direct to threat. You go direct to the sound of the gunfire. So if something would happen on this campus, myself, the village police, the other officers here, the state patrol, the park rangers, everybody, sheriff, would go directly to the sound of the gunfire. And what, has, what that has done is the average school shooting is now two to three minutes. Now that sounds terrible because two to three minutes is a long time, but as compared to nine minutes, um, it's it's a lot better so we we train for that we never stop worrying about it and it's just something that's always on the tip of my mind every single day would you like to go ahead and have the video yeah we'll show the video and what just a little bit uh, talk about the video is is and I'll talk about it afterwards is this is a very good video about your options as opposed to just not doing anything and being you know shot or hurt by one of these people um, it will tell you how to run, hide, or fight, and then we'll talk about a little bit more about that individually after the video. Okay. Thank you. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. Warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. 
Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight. Act with aggression. Improvise weapons. Disarm him. And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. Chief Borden, that was a, a video that was troubling to watch in a sense, but yet very informative. What are the takeaways that we should have from this video? Well, the, <clears throat> the number one takeaway is, just like I said, police had to change their strategy as opposed to surrounding the building with <clears throat> overwhelming force is going direct to the threat. What we're trying to teach people and let people know and what this videotape um, expounds on very well is that the victims have options as opposed to maybe in the past where there was no thought of any option it's just a bad guy came in he's going to shoot everybody and you have to wait your turn to be shot <clears throat> what this does is it tells you that you do have options and i talked to all of our freshman classes and i talked to a lot of groups and the first thing that i do to prelim this is to tell you that what this guy is expecting is panic and what you have to understand is they've researched this like I said earlier, the average school shooting now is two to three minutes. That guy knows that. And the thing that you have to understand is an active shooter has no exit strategy. They are not coming to this school or someplace to shoot a few people and then say, okay, I'm sorry, everything's good now. They have no exit strategy. They know 
that their life in one way or another is over with that day. They're either going to end it themselves, the police are going to shoot them, or they're going to be arrested. So you have to have the mindset of survival. And part of taking that panic away from what this guy is trying to make you panic is to have a plan. So part of that plan I tell all the students and what I tell everybody here is that the next, even if you're at, you know, especially if you're in a, we're talking specifically the college is and the university is, any classroom you're in, any office you're in, and this even applies in the public sector, if you go to the movies, I mean, it, you, you see we've had movie theater shootings, mm -hmm. okay. you go to church, you go any place, yeah. it's just take five or six seconds and look around that room and think, if I had to run out of here, if an active shooter came in, where would I run to? Could I go out this door? Would I go out that door? Um, would I, where would I hide? If I had to hide, how would I hide? And if I had to fight, what would I use to fight? And that takes part of the panic because the initial thing that happens, they come in, they shoot, you hear shooting, boom, boom, boom. You remember the bank robberies back in the Western days and the bank robberies you watch in the movies. What do they do? They come in and they shoot into the roof, they yell, they scream, they curse, everything. They're trying to induce panic and this is what what these people do is they come in and they induce panic and they just expect everybody to panic. Um, so what you do is you look around the room and then if you've got in your mind that if I go into this room and something happens, I can run out this door. The number one thing to do that this tape is a good example of is common sense says if you're not in a room or you're not in the building, a bad guy can't shoot you. So if there's a door you can get out, you hear shooting upstairs, you can get out the side door, you can get out of the hallway, get out of that room, and you're gone, you've already survived. You run as fast as you can, and you, you, you get out of there, go call the cops, just get out of there. Um, the second option is to hide. You may not be able to get out. The shooting's out in the hallway. If it's a room like this, if the door shuts and you can lock it, that's great. If you can't, then you barricade it. Your goal is to make it as hard as you can for that guy to get in because that clock is running from the, when he fires that first shot, he knows he's got about three minutes. So your goal is to make that clock run so if you can barricade the door, take everything heavy, desks, tables, whatever, and barricade the door, the odds are he's not going to spend very much time trying to get in here because his clock is running. He's going to go look for softer targets. Um, so you barricade, lock the door. A lot of rooms have they got windows. I mean, when I talk to the kids, a lot of the kids will, will point to the window because I said, if you can't get out the door, where you can go? Um, you bust a window out and you jump out the window. If you Google Columbine and Virginia Tech, you'll see that there was many, many students that were injured jumping out windows. And, you know, as opposed to a broken ankle to getting shot, that was a good, right. so, so they're, they're out of there and, and you can survive. And that's what this is about. The worst case scenario is, you can't run. Wrong place, wrong time. Guy comes into the, your room. Um, there's no place to go. And at that point, you have to make a personal decision. Am I, you know, am I going to fight? And that's what, you know, people like me that go around and talk about this are saying is, if if you can't run, you can't hide. That you should fight. And that means whether you're throw, picking up chairs and throwing them, cameras, your laptops, your cell phones, pencils, um, book bags, water bottles, coffee cups, anything, you throw them directly at the shooter's head. Aim right for the eyes. Um, can't see, can't shoot. Um, and what you're hoping is, one, you drive them out of the room. Two, somebody whacks them upside the head and incapacitates them. And that's the best case, but at the very least, if you can drive him out of that room, then you've survived. And like I said, these guys research it, and they know with the three minutes that they have to wreak as much havoc as they can. And, you know, and a lot of times, a lot of these shootings, when they run out of people that aren't barricaded, that aren't, they continually shoot the same people over and over. I mean, Virginia Tech. That guy fired 174 rounds oh. and shot 32 Goodness people. Wow. Um, Columbine, those kids just fired 176 rounds, all point blank. So mm -hmm. if you can get yourself hidden or out of the area, then you've got a really good chance to survive because they are not going to spend a lot of time um, breaking into doors. Closets, if you can get into a closet. It doesn't sound like a lot, but like there's a closet over here. If you can get in there, shut the door. A lot of times if they come into the room, 
they see people um, that aren't in here anymore or some people have been victims, if they don't physically see you, there's many stories where the guy will leave the room and not, they don't have time to go open closets and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So even if you don't do a whole lot, um, you do something. I was off before the show, I was talking to you about the shooting in California. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great story to go along with the hiding is uh, there, was a, there was a man that was in the restroom when the shooting started. Another man ran into the restroom. My understanding is it was a restroom door that didn't lock. Both gentlemen laid on their backs, put their four feet against the door, held on to things on the side and jammed the door shut and kept one of the shooters from coming into the restroom there. Now it doesn't sound like they did a lot, but as opposed to letting that guy come in there and just start shooting, they did something and that's all we're talking about is to do something. Another point that you made when you've talked to different groups on campus that I really appreciated and really hadn't thought about that much was that after the police have come and the shooter's been hopefully somehow um, killed or incapacitated, the, the police officers still don't know who the good guys are, so to speak, and the bad guys. So you have to be very careful because you don't want to be confused for one of the people who has been doing the shooting. That's a very good point that I talk to the kids about is, is in, when the state patrol came here a couple years ago, um, Mike Thompson, his wife, and a lot of um, people on campus were, were part of that scenario, playing victims and stuff like that. But it is a very hectic scene, and what we tell people is if you've been shot or you've been injured, and what you're doing is you're waiting for the police to come. You want the police to come, and you see the police, and you think that they're going to administer first aid and help you and take you out, is that they will leave you there. And it's going to hurt your feelings because you're going to be thinking they're here to help me, but they're not. They're, they have to go find the bad guy. So what we're talking about, what you're asking about, is once the, the bad guy's incapacitated, they've got him, you need to just stay where you're at. If you're hidden in a room someplace, barricaded in, stay there till the police come and get you. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go wandering around. You st because what happens is you be, say you barricade yourself and your office is up where you're at and you don't hear shooting for another for a couple of minutes and you think everything's okay. The problem is the guy could be wounded, he could be mm -hmm. reloading, he could be looking for other victims, he's ran out of victims. And what if you, if you and your staff go out because you think it's okay, then you've walked right back into them again. Uh, so stay where you're at. That way you're safe, you're barricaded. Um, the police will come and find you. Uh, when the police come, you got to understand they're going to be hopped up too because they've seen injured people. They've seen people that's been shot. They know there's a bad guy with a gun. So you want to be as calm as you can. If they burst into a room, what you can't do is stand up and go yelling, hey, help me, help me, like that, because they're not sure who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Is there more than one shooter? Used to be there was always one shooter, but um, the shooting in California was two shootings. Yeah. And FBI said that that's the first shooting, and the, only the second shooting in the last 166 where there was more than one person. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what's, I mean, it's pretty sad that they can go back and say 166 that yeah, there's, there's been that many. So. So, very good point. Just stay calm. If you're hidden, stay where you're at till the police come and get you. They'll find you. Don't rush at the police. Stay calm and because you've survived and you don't want to get hurt after you survive. So. I've seen that video now a few times and I'm always struck by the fact that they're not helping the victims. They're not even stopping to look at the victims. They're looking directly to where can I find the shooter and deal with that situation. The motto is they tell when they do the training, they say, get the bad guy, go find him. And if you stop and do first aid, as horrible as it sounds, if someone's shot in the leg or something, if you spend 15 seconds um, taking the time that that, because another story that I told the, the shooting at Sandy Hook, 12 seconds after the first police officer pulled into the lot, that guy shot himself. And that ended that event. So as quickly as the police can get there, they hope that the event has ended. So any time that you take to, to do first aid or triage or anything like that. And I guess the last thing, two things I would say is I want to reemphasize 
that you have to have the mindset of survival because active shooters have no exit strategy. They're not coming in to take hostages or not, so you need to do that. Um, if you see something, say something. You've seen Homeland Security mm -hmm. says that out. If you see somebody acting strange, call right away. And we always tell everybody you can do everything you can knowing that you can't do everything. So we, we, we plan and we plan and you can do everything you can, but you just have to know that you can't do everything. One thing I really appreciate about you and, and your staff is that you're so willing to come and talk to us and help us. I know you came and talked to several groups of faculty members and I was present. We really hadn't thought about all of the things that, are, that you've brought up today. And as a result of what you did, we do have plans for the classrooms and for the office areas. And I think that's a real credit to Raya Grand and to your force and is that you have helped us to develop that plan so that we can keep our students, our faculty, and our staff safe. Well, I appreciate that, and trust me, the, the, I think my number one mission here is to keep you guys safe and to keep the students safe and all of the visitors, and that's our mission, and, and anything that we can do to help that mission, that's what I'm here for. Well, we appreciate that a lot, and I can, I can second what Dr. Mitchell su suggested. I've, I've seen the video, I've heard you speak a number of times, and I have, when I go into a room now, whether it's a meeting or for a class or whatever, I do have in the back of my mind, and often I will think, okay, there's the windows, there's the only exit, or there I've got two exits, there's a desk over here, and I start thinking about just what happens, what, what, what could be, what could I use? And that's unfortunate, but it's also fortunate. And the fact that you do that is exactly why we do this, is because what they're counting on you all know, everybody can think of moments when they panicked in their life, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? If you've already got that mindset, this is what I'm going to do, that two or three seconds is, is I'd be all of what it takes. And, well, thank you for being with us this, no, this yes, afternoon. Yes, absolutely. No, thank absolutely. you. We appreciate your willingness to come on and share this, share the video with us. We know that you're going to be uh, doing this on campus uh, again yes, for sir. both student populations as well as faculty and staff, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, we also appreciate the viewers who are willing to work with us and, and show up and, and watch the, the podcast, and we invite you back to another podcast, and thank you again for joining us.